Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome on this Good Friday. I was talking with someone on the phone this morning and the, que the question was, why do we call it Good Friday? So, um, of course, the reason why we call it Good Friday is because of all the good that has come out of the crucifixion. It's tempted to call it Bad Friday, and in many ways it is Bad Friday. It's the, one of the greatest uh, injustices, or the greatest injustice in history, of course, the Lord Jesus being crucified. But God causes all things to work together for good, and it's worked it out for our salvation. So he part of his plan all along. So it's Good Friday. So welcome, glad that you're here. The fun question of the day will be on the table again. So it's there for you to have some guided discussion around the tables at lunch. I hope you'll, you'll stay. This service lasts just 12, 15 minutes, and then there is lunch, free lunch, in the uh, banquet hall, fellowship hall, just back this way. So I hope you'll stay for that. So let me pray and commit our time to the Lord, and then Pastor Twitty will preach God's word. Merciful God, we gather on this day, this Good Friday, uh, indeed feeling like it on the one hand should be called Bad Friday, but because of our sin, it had to happen. And because of your goodness and because of your power, it's a wonderful thing and it's fantastic that it did happen. And that the Lord Jesus is risen from the grave and that shows vindication and victory over the grave. So even though this is a day for sobriety and contemplation, we rejoice because we know the end of the story. And so, Lord, we pray that you would enable us to meditate upon it well, both this day and the day looking forward, Resurrection Sunday. I pray your blessing on our time now uh, the fellowship around the table, the meal as well. Lord, we pray for your blessing on Hunter as he brings your word to us. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, good afternoon. It's uh, good to see you all. And as... Um, Pastor Brock said, uh, today is Good Friday, and in the life of the church, uh, today's a holy day, and there's a lot we mean by a holy day, but the main thing that we mean is that on a holy day, we set aside time for God. That's pretty much what we mean by a holy day. And in particular, uh, on today, Good Friday, we set aside time to remember the death of God the Son, the Son of God. So, to that end, I invite you to turn with me uh, in your Bible to the place where we read about the death of God the Son, and that is in Matthew chapter 27. And we're going to look together for just a few minutes at verses 45 through 56, and that's on page 834, 835, if you want to read along with us in the Pew Bible. So, Matthew chapter 27. Verses 45 to 56, page 834, 835. I'm going to read this passage for us. So to that end, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Hear the Word of the Lord. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, The man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. 
And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were open, and many bodies of the saints who'd fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Amen. You may be seated. Well, what we just read is a historical account of what took place on Friday, April 3rd, AD 33, from 12 to 3 p.m. So what we just read is a historical account of real events that took place Friday, April 3rd, AD 33, from 12 in the afternoon, right now, till 3 p.m. That's Now, at 9 a.m. on the morning of April 3rd, Jesus of Nazareth, known by those in Judea and Jerusalem as the prophet from Galilee, he was crucified. He was crucified by way of public execution at the order of the then Roman procurator of Judea, a, one of the three provinces of the land that we know as Palestine. He was ordered to be crucified by the Roman procura procurator of Judea, Pontius Pilate. And the charge was a form of sedition, a form of uh, threatening to undermine the state of Rome. And we know this because Above his cross, Pontius Pilate had written the charge for which Jesus of Nazareth was executed, namely, being the king of the Jews. So he was crucified by order of Pontius Pilate for a form of sedition. Now that's just bare historical sketch that no one really who has any historical, or let me say it this way, kind of intellectual integrity that's willing to look at facts would debate. Now, when you hear those facts as they are recorded for you in the New Testament, every time you hear what you heard read, you have to make a decision. I mean, this account of the death of Jesus of Nazareth is not written to tell you facts. It is written to call you to make a decision. And so today, right here and now, regardless of however you define your faith, you have to make a decision. You have to decide how you're going to respond to what you've heard. So that's what Good Friday is for. Whether you follow Jesus your whole life, whether you're hearing about him for the first time, it doesn't matter. When this text is read, it calls you to make a decision, and the decision is, how am I going to respond to what I have heard? Now, there are a lot of things that you can do with what you've heard. Um, the Gospels are full of people who heard about Jesus of Nazareth, who saw him teach, who saw him in person, and made all kind of different responses to him. And so the job of a preacher, which is what I am, is to give you a specific response. A specific response to what took place on Friday, April 3rd, AD 33 at 3 p.m. And so I have just a few minutes to urge you with all that I have to respond to the death of Jesus of Nazareth in two ways with fearful faith and devoted service. That's, that's the response to the death of this man. Fearful faith and devoted service. Now, why fearful faith? Well, because what Jesus of Nazareth did is the most serious thing that anyone has ever done. No one has ever done what he did. What did he do? 
Well, in the church, we put it like this. He descended into hell. On the cross, he descended into hell. What is hell? Hell is an experience. Before it's a place, it's an experience. Hell is an experience. In the experience of what? Hell is what happened when God withdraws. God is good. God is light. Everything that is good and everything that is like light, that brings life, that's God. And when God withdraws, when God leaves, all that's left are two things, evil and darkness. That's hell. When God withdraws, that's hell. When light withdraws, when good withdraws, that's hell. So what's happening on the cross is happening on two levels. On the one level is just historically what's taking place. On the deeper level is the spiritual level of what Matthew's telling us is happening. What's happening is that the Father and the Spirit are withdrawing from the Son. Which is why he said, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. Why have you forsaken me? That's what hell is, to be forsaken by God. So on the cross... Jesus of Nazareth is doing something that no one has ever done. He is experiencing hell. He's descending on the cross into hell. And then at 3 p.m., he died. Matthew says he gave up his spirit. Now, if Matthew had not told us two things, we all probably would have concluded that the death of Jesus, while tragic, was not unprecedented. I mean, you'd have to say that. If you were honest, you'd have to say that. You'd have to say that even though that this man's death was tragic, it had happened before. There were before the days of Jesus and since the days of Jesus, people who died wrongful deaths for their beliefs. That had happened before. But the way that we know that this death was unprecedented is from the fact that Matthew says two things happened when he died. One is that the curtain inside the temple, this gigantic sanctuary atop a large hill in Jerusalem, 34 and a half acres in size, this enormous temple, inside of that inner sanctuary stood a, a, a curtain several inches thick, several feet high, and was torn from top to bottom. So not only that, but also, Matthew says, at the time, at 3 p.m. on April 3rd of AD 33, many people who had passed away, life returned to their bodies. Okay, now those two facts indicate to us that this is an unprecedented death. No one has ever died a death like this. And so when Jesus of Nazareth descended into hell, from the things that Matthew tells us, we realize he didn't just descend into hell. He didn't just die. He destroyed death. That's the point of the curtain tearing in two. That's the signal that the death of Jesus has done more than we thought. He's actually destroyed death himself, itself. So I say that because, friends, you know, today is Good Friday. I hope all of you will come back to the sanctuary on Easter Sunday somewhere, if not here, somewhere. And the point of Easter is, to, is, is just this. So all across the world, people like me are going to issue invitations for you to put your faith in Jesus of Nazareth. And when we do that, we're making you an offer. And I want to be very clear. What's on offer here is not a fresh start. What's on offer here is resurrection from the dead. 
That's what, that's what Christianity offers. We're not offering you a fresh start, a clean... We're not offering you just that. We're not offering you just the wiping away of your sins, just the, the cleansing of your past, just a turning over a, a new leaf. We are offering that, but that is not the main thing. The main thing that's on offer with Jesus of Nazareth is resurrection. Life from the dead. And that's what his death means. And that's why when you see that and when you feel that, the appropriate response is not just faith, but fearful faith. Fearful faith like this Roman guard who stood there and watched this and somehow, by the grace of God, saw what I just told you and said, truly this man is the Son of God. He is God on earth. God has just done something here. And I don't know what all he's done, but I do know that what I just saw was God. And so that's why we say fearful faith. For you to respond correctly to the death of Jesus of Nazareth is to decide in your heart, truly this man is God. Truly this man is the Son of God. And then for the rest of your life, you're going to devote yourself to his service. That's Christianity. We, we, we believe this man. We have fearful faith. And then we devote ourselves to his service for the rest, for as long as we have breath. And if you need an example of that, all you really need to do is look at these women that we're told about at the end of the passage in verses 55 to 56. If you need an example of what we're talking about, about with devoted service, all you need to do is look at these women who came with Jesus from Galilee to the cross. So they're there with him at the cross, and this was a dangerous thing. Jesus had other disciples, men, whom he taught, whom he trained, and they're nowhere to be found, and yet we have this small band of women who did have the fearful faith to follow him to the cross. It was dangerous for them to be there. But why were they there? They were there for one simple reason. They had made up their minds. They said in their heart, look, we believe him. We believe him. We do think he's the king of kings. We do believe he's the Lord of Lords. We do believe he's the Son of God. We believe he's the King. And you know what? That makes us his servants. If we believe his, he's the King, that makes us his servants. And so, friends, what's on offer today with the death of Jesus is a resurrection. And once you're raised from the dead, what's on offer is life together with the King a new life, a new purpose, and a new service to God himself. And that's why Good Friday is good. Because it's resurrection from the dead and because it's life together with God and with his family forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, at the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, when heaven remembers the work of the Son, there's silence. There's a time for the people who've heard the word to just be still and to take it in. And to just have an opportunity, whoever they are, wherever they're from, Whatever their past is, whatever their present is, whatever they do have, whatever they don't have, they put all that to the side and say that the only thing that matters is this man on his cross and the word that his followers say about it. That if, if anyone believes in him, they will not die, but they'll have life eternal. They'll be raised from the dead. They'll live a new life. They'll have a new family. They'll have, new, they'll have a new place. They'll have a new position. And so, Father, I pray that you would grant us to have this fearful faith and that for the rest of our lives we would be marked by, your, by devoted service to you. And we pray it in the name of this Jesus and for his sake. Amen.